Hello, everybody. Very pleasant good afternoon and welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we'll explore our guest's personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Please continue to join us for our upcoming episodes, always at 12.30 p.m. live on Zoom. Melanie Mandel's on November 2nd, and Judge Susan Lopez Giss on December 7th. We'll be announcing our 2023 lineup shortly, so stay tuned for that. Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. You will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. The Family Law section is sponsored by White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt, and Our Family Wizard. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. Okay, that's it for our sponsors. Today we welcome Neil Hirsch. Neil truly needs no introduction, but I'll give one a shot anyway. He's a founding partner of Hirsch Manis, and with 40 years of family law experience, he's nationally known as one of our field's leading practitioners. He's been a member and often the chair of just about every family law organization out there, too many to list, including our own section here. Later this month, Neil, along with friend of the program, Alexander Leichter, is going to be receiving the BHB Legends Award live at State of Department 2. So we're happy to get in front of that, kind of jump the gun a little bit and have Neil on first. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Happy to be here and join you. All right. We're going to have some fun today. Get into your personal story, of course. But I want to start with uh, something that I know you do a lot for others, kind of serving as a mentor and move some of your best advice up to the very front of the program I think all attorneys, aspiring attorneys, veteran attorneys, everybody can learn so much. So let's start big picture. If you were starting from scratch, hanging a family law shingle out, maybe for the first time, what would you be doing? What would you be thinking about? Well, obviously, you know, that's a big undertaking in order to be able to start from the ground and run with it. Um, and of course, if to, if to do that, you have to rely on your network of people family, friends, or charitable organizations that you belong to, um, it's a big hustle. Um, we are a profession, and I think that's first and foremost what I consider myself a legal professional, but marketing obviously is a part of that because you need to get clientele. So uh, I was mentioning when I, uh, I practiced law for several years, and then I decided to leave law for a year, which I could talk about later, but when I came back, I made a list of every family law lawyer, actually every lawyer that I knew, and I called people up and I'd say, well, what do you charge for a retainer? And they would say whatever they said. And I said, well, I'll charge half of whatever you charge for any of the cases you don't want. Uh, and civil lawyers, I told them I did family law. And I just actually spent days calling everyone I knew to try to, you know, see if I could drum up business. And then I would go back and I would obviously recall people. And back in the day, I remember calling uh, one particular guy up uh, and I would call him up and I'd say, look, I'm starving. I need a case. And every time I called, invariably, I would get something thrown my way. It wasn't necessarily big. It, it, that's not true. It wasn't big for sure, um, <laughs> but it was work. And so, you know, you just have to you develop a, a constant um, coterie of people that you want to call. I say to people in my office, I believe in taking every lunch and every meeting that you can. We all have to have a lunch. Might as well try to see somebody and maybe develop some business or friendships during that hour. I tell people to take meetings with every person, even if they don't think they could afford us. 
because I want a person to leave saying, I wish I could afford that guy or that firm because they become your, your marketing tool uh, when they leave you. So you don't have to close every deal with a particular client who you're sitting in front of. You can just uh, you know talk to these people nonetheless, and that's how it works. Ours is not a business. I also tell people, you can't go to a cocktail party when they ask what you do and you say you're a divorce lawyer. Nobody wants to take your card because if they take your card, their spouse is going to kill them. So <laughs> that's not how you get business. You get business by they remembering your name and then days, weeks, or even months later, maybe they'll call you. So it is just a constant, um, you know, vetting the, the community for uh, referrals and, and, and clients. Besides networking and building relationships, do you think it's important or helpful or necessary to have a partner early on? Well, I, I didn't. Uh, you know, I, Joe Manis is my partner and dear friend, of course, one of my best friends. Um, I, I, we always say to one another, uh, you know, we wish we would have been partners 20 years before. I would have been a lot richer and a lot happier because it was it was been it's been a great 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 run. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great a great you know opportunity if you can do it. Um, but many of us can't, and I certainly didn't for a lot of years. Um, but when I worked for people, Simon Tob specifically, uh, he was a mentor who just showed me the ropes and you know in ways that were phenomenally helpful to me in my career. Um, and you know, you, if you don't have a partner, you want to try to find someone who you could work for who would be a great mentor to you. And Simon was certainly that for me. And in later years, I can mention further, Sorrel Trope, who I didn't work for, uh, he became also one of uh, my most important mentors when I was developing my firm. I would reach out to Sorrel to find out how you could develop a firm. Simon was a sole practitioner. Obviously, Sorrel wasn't. So when I was building my firm, Sorrel was very, very helpful on how to administrate, manage, et cetera. So as a younger attorney, what would you be looking to do? We'll talk more about the mentoring side. You mentioned finding an attorney that could teach you, but what, what would you want to learn at this point? If you, were, if you were starting again, what would be the most important skills or things that you would be looking to do early on? So that's a good question. Um, I don't know if this is exactly on point. I hope it is. But what I tell people uh, who work for me, new lawyers, is to read the materials. When I was coming up, CFLR was printed in notebooks. There were three volumes, I believe, two or three volumes. And I would tell people to take those books home and read them like you were reading a novel. Don't ever try to learn it all because it's impossible. Just read it to become familiar with it. Because when we get out of school, I mentioned this to Dan and Lauren while we were you know, talking offline, um, you, you're a dangerous person, in my view, as a lawyer. You don't know what you don't even know. And you're out there you know, saying, yeah, I can do anything and everything. Well, it's not the case. So if you study and read the materials, at least when a question comes up, you'll know you've seen it somewhere before and you'll know where to go. So, and by the way, that will serve you well in preparation for trial work because preparation, in my view, is the key to you know, everything that we do. So as a young lawyer, what, uh, what I would recommend to a young lawyer, that is, is studying the material uh, as, as best you can ask questions of people you work with or you know about the stuff that you've read and just try to get a familiar familiarity with the breadth of the subject matter of family law, which is vast. You know, I say to people, family law, which has always been really underrated in my opinion until the last many years, it's a different view, but previously it was very underrated. And I think it's probably the most complex area of the law that there is because it covers the gamut of everything you can imagine every business issue, every financial issue we have to deal with. And we have to become actually a master of all trades, not, you know, not just one. So um, I think it's very intellectually stimulating, but in order to get that intellectual stimulation, you got to read and prepare. So that nexus between learning the law and becoming a, a qual an expert, a qualified practitioner and building the business, where is that for you? When would you start trying to bring in new cases versus just trying to soak things up? There's, in, in my view, respectfully to all these young lawyers out there, it's you got to do it all. I mean, my legal assistant has been with me for 39, 40 years almost since the beginning, 35 years, I should say. Um, and back in the day, she did the billing and she did the filing and she did the typing. And, you know, th there, there was nothing that, you know, we didn't do. It was just the two of us. So there would be nothing to bill if I didn't have a client. I needed to get the client. I needed to learn the law. And, you know, you need to do it all, as we all know, who have come up 
as sole practitioners. And, you know, Lauren has affirmed now, I don't know, you know, before you were on your own, you took a partner, but if you were on your own, you know, we all know what it's like. You have to do everything and do it fairly well to, to get by. So the answer to your question directly is you got to start hit the ground running and do it all, in my view. What about more established attorneys as opposed to younger attorneys? Um, once you're once you've got your feet under you, how do you continue to build a firm and how do you grow? So, some time ago, I ran into a, a friend of mine. I was we were both at the airport going somewhere for business, and he said, "So why do you keep hustling?" You know, and I said then, as I say now, because if you stop, the the cases stop. We do not have a practice where we have clients on retainer. I've said to everybody that I know that if I was in the business of having retainer clients, it would be fantastic for me. I don't really regret the choice I've made. I don't regret it. But I have a type of personality I've been able to make and keep friends. So if I had clients on retainer, I wouldn't have to beat the bushes every single day for a new client. When we close a client, yeah, we sometimes get repeat business. They get married again and they come again but they have to get a new boyfriend or girlfriend they got to get engaged you got to get married and then they got to get divorced okay it's a long gap between here and temporary right <laughs> so return business isn't around the corner so we always have to beat the bushes for new cases and if we stop it stops and i, I could tell you a story about that too where i had yeah, one tell us referral. tell us tell us the story i had a great referral source a new york lawyer who came here from new york and he was not practicing family law. He actually worked in the entertainment industry. And this guy took a liking to me and sent me case after case after case after case. It was great. Then he decided he was going to take the California bar. That was great too. But when he was in New York, he was in a taxi cab and he lost his bar materials. So he couldn't take the bar the first time around. So that postponed the inevitable for a period of time. Then he took the bar and I thought he was going to go, inter go into entertainment law. Alas, to my the chagrin. I was wrong. He decided to go into family law. And from the day he said that, my business dropped like 60, 70%. Boom. One, two, wow. three. And I slowed up on my marketing and taking lunches and meetings because this guy was just like, I, I couldn't even keep up with what he was sending me. And then it was over. He took it for himself, which of course I didn't blame him, but it taught me a lesson that I've never forgotten that, you know, life can change on a dime. And if we don't keep, you know, trying to develop things, there's a, there's a result, there's a repercussion of that. That's me. What I do with the younger lawyers here in my firm, all of them, is we speak to them, Joe and I, to see what their areas of interest are, what their networking groups are, and we try to get our younger lawyers started early in thinking about how they can bring in business. You're not going to be an equity partner in a firm unless you have a book of business. And while we don't necessarily need young lawyers to bring us business, we want them to have that self-confidence. And frankly, I like the idea of having younger lawyers bring business because they're my exit strategy. They're my retirement plan. One day they'll be, you know, bringing in more business than I. And maybe if I'm lucky, they'll keep me around to be an emeritus and, you know, give me a little closet and a few dollars a month. And, you know, I could have a place to go. So it, it benefits them, of course, and it also benefits me. So that's, I, I think that's that, that cultural aspect is really important and I, I have a question on both sides of it how difficult has it been for you and joe to build that out to find and hire the right people to fit that mindset and on the flip side of that how do you know when it's not working when it's time to move on from an associate or even a partner well answering them in order obviously over the last almost 25 years we've been together we've stubbed our toes in making certain selections. It just hasn't been the right fit. But by and large, um, we have a core group of, of lawyers who've been with us for a very, very long time, and um, they're going to stay, God willing, with us. Um, my view, and I think Joe would agree, is first and foremost, we want people who we like, and we think we could have you know, lunches and dinners with and so on, and spend a lot of time because we're together a lot. You know, I, I've said the office is sort of our sanctuary away from home. And if it's horribly frenetic, I don't allow yelling in this place. I don't, I mean, it's gotta be, it has to be civilized and respectful because 
this is where I spend a great deal of my time and I don't want to be in that environment. So we have to find like-minded people in terms of their, you know, their attitude about how their work ethic is. And then of course we want people that we think are um, highly, you know, capable of getting the topic and learning it. And we want, you know, people who are very uh, adept at what they are, that they're doing or eager to be, learn to become adept. And we look for um, what we consider to be um, a work ethic. We don't, um, you know, there's this topic now about, you know, leaving work early. I forgot what it's called. Uh, something quiet quitting. Um, I'm not a fan of that. You know, we don't live in a world where our business stops at five o'clock. We need people. We're not slave drivers. I, I don't like all nighters. I don't like people to work crazy hours. And again, there's a self-centered and, and selfish reason for that. I don't want to burn out my good people. If I burn them out and they can't take this anymore and they leave, I've won a battle, but I've lost the war. So I'm not interested in that. So I like a reasonable work schedule, but I like people who know that if something has to be done and you have to work on a weekend or something, we all have to do that. We're trial lawyers. During trial, there are no weekends and there are no nights. They, we, we have to exist for the task at hand. So we look for people that we think will fit that ethic. How do we know we, we haven't reached that mark? Um, I think from I think the question sort of begets the answer. You know it when you see it, and you see it pretty readily if it doesn't work out. So we, as I said, we've stubbed our toes, but we've been fortunate to see it pretty early on, and uh, deal with it basically. So switching gears a little bit, we want to hear about your personal history and your story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, when you first started thinking about law school and what that path was? Well, so, so yes, of course. Um, law school was always where I was going to go. I don't really remember when this happened, but um, I was involved in student government in junior high and high school. And um, high school um, was the only class I ever got a D in was chemistry. And, and I... My, my professor, my teacher, would let me cheat on the quizzes. You can get three points for just attending. And I never got more than three points. So chemistry was not for me. Med school was not for me. I really didn't like accounting. Um, and my dad wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer, or, you know, or an accountant. So it had to be one of those three paths, right? If, if I was going to you know, grant his wish, yeah, that would yeah. be it. And uh, by process of elimination, and because I talk a lot, uh, Easy. Law, school, law school was it. So that, that I never really varied from it, right from school, you know, from college on, from high school on, actually, I knew what I was going to do. And then when you got there, was it what you expected? Actually, uh, as I was thinking about this program last night, I was going to tell you, the answer was, I almost didn't get here. In my second year of law school, I had a lunch with my mother at uh, Bullock's, the then Bullock's Wilshire, now the Bullock's Wilshire building. Uh, then it was the, sh the, the store. They had a coffee shop on the third floor or something. And we went there because I was thinking about, seriously thinking about quitting law school. And she really urged me to finish. It was at the end of second year. She said, finish second year. And then she urged me to go on to the third year. And she said, you don't want to practice. You know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge then. And um, I did. And because um, I hated second year. Don't ask me why, but I did. And in third year, um, I approached it with a different attitude. And it was off and running. But well, now I have to ask you, why did you hate the second year? You know, I'm going to tell you this. It, it was for the same reason that I hated law when I left for the year that I left. Um, it was all consuming to me. I didn't have any other mm. outlet. And I, I couldn't leave it for a minute. I couldn't, you know, I, when I was asleep, I was thinking about it. When I woke up, I was thinking about it. I didn't have a peaceful moment to myself other than thinking about, you know, corporations or remedies or whatever the classes were that I took second year that I really didn't love. Um, and it, it was just, it, it got too all consuming. And I just said, this is not how I want to live my life. And when I left for the year I left, um, it wasn't really for that reason. Um, I went into business with some business partners and I just thought that that would be uh, an opportunity that I wanted to try out, which uh, I tried it and I decided I liked law better and I came back. But that year that I left, um, when I came back, I came back with a much different attitude. And as I was mentioning to Lauren off camera, um, there are times in this business where it gets very, very stressful. You know, 
And it's unfortunate because the person calling us, nothing is nothing is more important than why they're calling us, right? It could be because the refrigerator is broken. They don't have money to pay for the refrigerator guy. Or it could be something about their children. It could be something very meaningful and important to me. Or it could be something very silly to me, like, you know, the refrigerator repair. But to that person, it's not silly at all. And when I begin to lose patience with the people on the other end of the phone, not outwardly, I hope I don't never do that. But inwardly, when I'm saying, oh, my God, this is just drivel. Can I please get off the phone? When that happens now, when I since I've come back, I know it's time to go outside and take a walk for an hour, take a day off and come back. It's not my client's fault. It's my fault, how I'm ingesting it and digesting it. So I'm better to myself about internalizing this stuff and knowing when I need a little bit of fresh air. Once you graduated, how did you get into family law? Did you start out there or did you start out in another area? So uh, I took a job at a firm called Freshman Rents, um, Komsky and Deutsch. And Warren Deutsch was the head of the family law department. And my job was half family law, half personal injury. And halfway during the, uh, the year I was there, they jettisoned the personal injury department and I did family law. And Warren was very, very good to me. He sent me all over California to go to CFLR classes, a lot of education, a lot of mentoring. And then a very good friend of mine uh, introduced me to Simon Taub, who was a sole practitioner looking for a person to work with. And Simon was literally, in my view, one of the deans of Beverly Hills Divorce. Uh, and even though Warren and I were very good friends, this was an opportunity I, I thought I couldn't pass up. And I went to work for Simon for five years. And after those five years, this is what came out. This is what I became. So, uh, tell us about that time with Simon. What did, what was he like uh, as a mentor, as an attorney in the courtroom? What did, what 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 do you still carry with you now from that time? So, on the on the more jocular side, Simon was a guy who was my father's age, but he was he was married. Uh, he was in his sixties, probably mid late sixties when I met him, and he became a dear friend and. Le- until he died, I was one of his best friends, and he one of mine. When I first met him, it was very unusual because he'd been married for one year in his 30s, but after that, he was single. And um, he would walk along the street with me at lunch, you know, looking, saying, look at that girl, and look at that, you know, just very um, not, you know, not politically correct kind of comments in today's world. Um, and, I, and I was like taken aback because my father would utter, I don't, I would hope he thought those things, my dad, but he would never utter them, that's for sure. And so I was like looking at this man, like who's my father's age, hearing this stuff and was very, you know, very discombobulating. Um, but he, we became very good friends, not not just like a father's son, but he called me his little brother. So that was the personal side. Um, the business side, as I mentioned to you guys when we were preparing for this, it was remarkable because Simon, um, first of all, he never kept a timesheet. And he didn't do any work during the week except talk to clients and do some reading. And on the weekends, he did all of his paperwork and gave me paperwork on Saturdays. I would come in and there'd be a stack of stuff on my desk for my assignments for the next week. Usually it was, it was Monday when I came in. He would give it to me. He would do it on a Saturday, lay out what I had to do for the week. So he was he was a really remarkable practitioner um, and a great, great person to learn from. As I mentioned to you guys, um, whenever I made a mistake, which I'm sure was more than I want to remember, uh, no recriminations ever. He would sit me in his office and fix the mistake. He'd write a letter to the other lawyer. He'd do a pleading. He'd call, make a phone call. And he'd fix the mistake with me watching how he did it. And then a few days later, he would bring me in and say, now let's talk about what happened and what had it not have that happen again. There wasn't one moment in five years of working for him and all the years of our friendship that this guy ever raised his voice. I never saw him lose his temper, ever. And which is why he lived to 90 some odd years old, I'm sure, um, because he just had a remarkable disposition. You know, he he loved law more than anybody else I know, other than perhaps Sorrel, um, family law specifically. And he worked seven days a week at the office. In the summers though, he took Sundays off to go to the beach, but that was it. He just, he was one of those old school practitioners who loved it. And was so even keel about it. It was it was amazing. So I I learned civility from him. I learned you know recriminations don't help. You bring a young lawyer in there and you start screaming at them. Okay, 
you lost them, right? They're scared. They don't know what to do. They feel like hell. How is that going to benefit me as a, in my firm? It doesn't. So you got to figure out a way to talk to people so they can get it and understand it. And, you know, uh, I was very, very blessed to have him for all those years. It sounds like he had your back. He did. He did, as I did his, yes. You also mentioned Sorrel Trove. What was your experience like with him, and what did you learn from him? You know, Sorrel, uh, in my estimation, and forget my estimation, that's just one person, the family law bar's estimation elevated family law from something that was not necessarily very, you know, well thought of into a respectable area of the law. That was him. He created the largest family law firm that existed up until, you know, he closed up. Um, he elevated the practice. You know, Sorrell was brilliant, elegant, ferocious in court. I mean, he, he had it all. He really had it all. And uh, we just, he took an affinity to me, which, you know, that's to my great benefit. And I would call him up when I was trying to build this practice and say, well, how do you, how do you handle, you know, 12 lawyers, 20 lawyers, you know, whatever the number was, as I was growing lawyers. And he gave me two bits of advice. I still say to this day, he said, you have to have a good memory, which thank God I do. Prevagen, I don't take yet, but I may when I need it. And he said, you have to learn how to delegate. And um, those two things, he said, is sort of the linchpin. And then, of course, you have to have people that you can delegate to who will execute your instructions and so on. Um, but I remember many a time we would, you know, have lunch at uh, uh, you know, somewhere by his office uh, and just sit and he would help me just with tips on how to grow the firm, which were invaluable. And then, of course, later on, we became very close friends with he and his wife. Uh, and we're so close with Linda, his his wife now. So he he was very very important to me and how I sort of developed this firm. And by the way, if you look at his office, um, Sorrell's offices were immaculate. They were beautiful. They were peaceful. You know, men had to wear uh, coats and ties uh, in the office, um, which I still think is the right way to do it. Although I'm outnumbered by everybody around me, but just okay. But, you know, he was really old school and real, the most professional, elegant, competent advocate. And that's on the, and then when you're in court, you know, the guy was like a pit bull. And that, that's, that's, he also taught me that, which I know I'm maybe going out of sequence, but here in my office, civility is the, the, the word of the day. In court, um, you have to be civil, but you need to be the most, you know, ferocious advocate you can be for your client. So the personality that you see now is not the personality you see in court. Um, I don't think that's, I don't, you know, I don't think that's the courtroom is not the place for, you know, sweet, kind and gentle. So what was it about those firms, maybe, especially because you were with Simon, you were never with Sorrel, but when you, when, when did it start to percolate a little bit that you wanted to step out, start your own firm? What happened? Where did you start to get business from? Tell us a little bit about the concept and then the execution. Well, okay, so this is, I don't, I'm going to shrink the story into a few minutes, but when I left Simon and I went on my own, huh? We've got time. <laughs> okay. So I left Simon and I went on my own and my best friend had been a family law lawyer in New York and he came out here to California to do immigration law and he was at freshman when I was there and we met on the first day and we became fast friends. He, his name is Richard Freyd, who's since passed. Um, introduced me to Simon. That's how I went to work for Simon. When I left Simon, I officed with Richard until I went to other space. Richard had been in New York and he knew all the family law lawyers because he was and had been a family law lawyer there. So he would take me to New York on a few trips to meet these these lawyers. And then as I told Dan and Lauren when, when we were preparing, um, I used to go to New York every three or four months to just as, to hustle business. I thought then, as I do think now, that um, when I was first starting out, everybody here was my competitor. But, I, you know, people in New York, they didn't know a lot of family lawyers, I didn't think. And there was business by coastal. So I thought if I started trying to develop business in New York, I could, you know, not have to deal with all the competitors here that are on this call so, or on this podcast. So I would go to New York every few months. And as I mentioned to you guys, I didn't have a dime to my name. And so I would, 
sleep on the floor in my friend's apartment, and I used the oak bar uh, in the Plaza Hotel as my base. And I would take somebody to lunch, somebody to drinks, and someone to, you know, like an early bar dinner, not a fancy dinner. Uh, and I did that for two or three days. And then I would fly home trying to act like a big shot. People knew the truth, I'm sure, and try to develop business. And I said to you guys, and it's true, I never went to New York. I didn't come back with a little something from one of these lawyers. It could be serving a subpoena. It could be, you know, a question about some research that they wanted done. I don't know. It was always a little something. And then one day, um, I think one of these guys in New York referred me to Julie Newmar uh, from the Batman days. And then lo and behold, uh, my business was developing. And Ralph Felder, who was another one of my mentors and dear friends and a great, great family law lawyer in New York, uh, said to me, I was coming home with my two children, young, they were obviously very young at the time. We were coming home from a, a day at the beach and he called me and said, you got to get over to this place to meet Robin Gibbons. She doesn't want to keep Marvin Mitchell, Marvin Mitchelson as her lawyer, and we want to get her for ourselves. I went, we got her, and that case became one of the most publicized divorce cases in America. Um, I was on TV every other day or two or three, and never did Felder do anything on television or in the press that he didn't include me. So that case, um, 1988, 87, something like that, when I first started my practice, really jumpstart me. And um, that really was the, the jump off point for how my practice grew. And as I told you guys, the, 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 the sort of the downside of that case is after the case was over, people would call me up and say, well, I'm sure you can't take my case because it's too little for you. And I'd be saying, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know, because I need, and that case is gone. I needed business. As I told you, we all need new clients. I said, no, no, I, no problem. I could take it. And, you know, but, you know, people think that if you do something that's so well publicized, that you wouldn't want their case. And they also said to you, our philosophy here is we treat everybody the same. I don't care if you have a billion dollars or a dollar. If we take your case and we take cases that, you know, people don't have a lot of money if we decide we want to, um, we treat you all the same because, you know, there but for the grace of God, you know, go all of us. And now we have to treat everybody with the same dignity and the same legal, uh, legal professionalism. So if the Givens case was the, the kind of an inflection point from a publicity or marketing standpoint, are there any other cases that stand out uh, in the same way, either a big win or some, some other aspect of the case on the legal side or how, how it's important to you in your development as, the, as an attorney beyond the publicity element? Well, uh, there've been a lot of you know, cases of celebrities that have gotten a lot of attention in the media. Um, Alec Baldwin, and we had Kim Basinger, that was a very hotly contested thing. Those kinds of things, you know, bring bring public attention. Um, and I guess that, you know, that helps with the development of the firm. Um, you know, you mentioned, I'm going to segue for one second, to, just to say this one point. Yeah. You know, we, we, there was a lot of television work. And, you know, people say, how do you become a talking head on television? And I would say to these people, it just, it just happens. They call you to do a story because I was representing Robin Givens or Kim Basinger and you do a piece and then somebody else sees it on a different network. And if you look halfway decent, which I'm sure I've changed not for the better in that respect. And if you sound halfway decent, they call you up and they start thinking of you as a person to call when they need a, you know, need a person to appear on air. And once you go on television a few times, people think that you're smarter than you are or more successful than you are. They have an image that if you're on TV, that means something. It means nothing. There's people who are, you know, so much smarter than me who probably haven't seen the inside of a television studio ever. Um, but I, it just happened to be my stroke of luck or turn of luck. So, um, you know, talking heads are just that. They're talking heads. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But the public has a different image of it. In terms of cases, you know, we talked about ours is a is a trial practice, and we have to learn trial skills. And so. You know, some of the cases that I think stand out, both wins and, and, and stubbing my toe, shall we say, um, they come from being in the courtroom. I mentioned a case uh, to Dan and Lauren where I was in court just beating the other side, at least I thought, and I think I was right. And then I asked one question. As the question was coming out of my mouth, I wanted to pull it back and after the, because it sort of changed the judge's thinking. And after the trial, he said to me, you asked one question. One, question too many. 
well, how would I have ever learned that lesson unless I, I, you know, unless I had that horrifically unfortunate experience, didn't, it wasn't like a death knell to the case, but it certainly was a very, very sobering lesson that you have to know every single question, what its import is and how it's going to resonate with the trier of fact. And so, you know, those are, those are lessons. You know, I, I also want to say that when we talk about trial skills, depositions are a great you know, learning ground because when you're defending a deposition, which I think is one of the most difficult things to do, and I, we train our lawyers, you can never let your guard down when you're defending a deposition. If the question is being asked, you have a split second to know what's the import of the question, should your client answer it, should you object, how do you handle it, and how is it going to affect the case? And that starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and it ends at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and you can't blink your eyes for a second because the one second you blink, your client's going to say something that you're going to regret that he or she said. So all these lessons about, you know, how to act in a courtroom or a deposition, um, they're lessons that have to be learned by, by experience and by doing it and by having a mentor help you. You know, in our office, we have people sit in on depositions. Don't always charge for it, but we have people sit in. Because how are they going to see how to do this? Reading a deposition is vastly different than experiencing it while you're there. So, you know, we, we try to let people see how that's done. And... I'll also sit on depositions of a younger associate in my office doing them to see how they're doing and be able to give them tips for the, for the same reason. So you can have, you know, kind of real time information at your disposal. I don't know if that answered your question spot on, but that, that's it. Not only did you uh, answer Dan's question, you also already answered the next question I was going to ask you, which was, <laughs> what do you learn from the losses? Um, but another, another aspect of that is, how do you handle the losses or the poor outcomes when they happen from time to time? And of course, they happen to all of us sometimes. But um, do you take them home with you? Um, do you let them go? How do you how do you handle that? Yeah. So I'm going to start by saying this. I say to the people in my firm, we don't live in a in a business where winners or losers are always clear. It's not a black and white practice. There's a lot of gray. Someone asks for ten dollars of support. Somebody else wants twenty. And the judge says fifteen. Who won? Who, who won? Who lost? We don't know. So what I say to people is, if you go in court and you aren't prepared, and you come back and you got a victory, don't tell me you're hot stuff. You were just lucky, and I don't give you any, you know, big credit for that. I'm happy you won. Don't get me wrong, but that was just the grace of God. Conversely, if you're prepared and we know you did a great job and you, you argued as well as you could, and the judge rules against you. You can't beat yourself up because judges have their own points of view. So the metronome of how we react to wins and losses is very internal. So, and we have to be cognizant of that. Otherwise, you know, you every loss you, that you have, you want to you know jump out of your skin. That doesn't help anybody. So, in my practice, in my view, money is fungible. We deal with people of lots and lots of money. And while I'm not saying a loss of money is okay with me, it's not. But a lot of times, if it's money, it's not the end of the world, even to the person who would have rather had a better result. It's still not tasteful. It's dis distasteful, I should say. But it's more palatable than other areas, such as custody. When custody is involved, uh, you know, you're dealing with something that, that we're not solemn. We can't split the baby on certain areas. That's why we go to court. So if you lose a custody case that you think is really important, you have a client who is really mortified and of course we take that to heart i mentioned to, the, to dan and to lauren that um my partner adam and i uh were trying a case and the judge made an interim order the day before my wife and i were scheduled to leave for europe and the interim order was in our favor and i left as high as a kite you know and, and was so excited to leave on this trip with this victory in my hand when we came back for the final decision it was against us and while I think the judge made a decision I wish he hadn't have made, um, I understand how he could have made it. Uh, I'm not happy he made it. And yeah, it was it was not it was it was pretty uh, disconcerting. Another case, um, I remember I had a move away case. The mom wanted to move to London, and I took over for another lawyer in my firm to try the case at a pretty late hour. But I'm not blaming that 
I lost the case. The man, uh, the woman was allowed to move to London. And the only saving grace to my emotional stability there was that my client uh, was able to move. He worked for a multinational company and they moved him to London straight away. So oh, wow. he didn't really, he didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I wasn't happy that he had to do that, but at least he still had his children in a 50, 50 relationship, albeit in London rather than here. So, yeah, I mean, we're human beings. Of course uh, I take losses um, hard. It's, it's not, it's not something we like and hopefully uh, it doesn't happen too often. So one of the through lines that I'm getting so far is the importance of your mentors and friends and, and partners in the both the practice and the personal side of this business to celebrate and commiserate and learn with and, and knowing some of your younger partners like Adam and Sarah and, uh, and how you're developing that talent. I'm curious about Joe now, and, and it's been so long together. What is it about Joe, an, another friend of the show and prior guest, that's made the partnership so successful for so long? So I'm going to tell you a couple of things and scroll back. We have been friends. He did his first divorce case with me, and I was a baby lawyer, and I was like thinking that this guy had it all. I remember him. I think he had a BMW, something I said, or a Porsche. I mean, I thought, okay, this is it. You know, he's a successful lawyer, and he and he was representing uh, Marilyn Wilson of the uh, Brian Wilson's wife, and he hired Simon to co-counsel with him because he'd never done a big divorce before, and he wanted Simon to help. And of course, I was the bag bear carrier for both those guys, and uh, that's how I first got started with Joe. And then we've obviously been friends over the years. We had a lawyer who worked for him, also worked for me, and I did that guy's divorce. And we were always enmeshed in some way. So when Joe, this is a really, really long story, but I was going to go into practice with Arlene Coleman Schwimmer. She decided not to go into practice because she was going to retire. She was going to work with me for three years, give me her practice, and go off into the sunset and retire. Um, for personal reasons, she decided to retire immediately. And the partnership didn't come to fruition. So um, I went ahead and ex was taking new space. Anyway, I called Joe and I said, might you want to consider? No, no, I'm sorry. I had hired a lawyer away from him to come to work for my new firm. And I had a drink with Joe to break bread and apologize for sort of rating this person. And we talked and he said, well, maybe I'd be interested in uh, joining you. And I said, well, geez, that's fantastic. Just let me know. I think it was Labor Day of 23 years ago, whatever it was. And he said, I'm going to my house in Santa Fe for the weekend. I'll let you know. And he called me that Monday and said, we're partners. And we started 30 days later. We have never had an, an agreement, a written agreement, just a handshake. He says that we've had two arguments. I remember one. <laughs> except I don't remember what the argument was about and <laughs> and it was not more than like five minutes okay was never a harsh word between us so you know he is one of the smartest human beings you could ever meet one of the nicest human beings you could ever meet um and I mean it was a sort of like a match made in heaven from the beginning so Simple as that, I guess. I don't I hope that answers the question. Yeah. All right. So now let's pivot again here because you, you you actually set this up. You said the Neil that we're getting to know so far is not the Neil that we would see in court. I want to meet that Neil for a second. So tell okay. us a little bit about that Neil. What's going on behind the lectern? Maybe your core philosophy and style around building a case and, and who shows up uh, in that courtroom, Moss. It's a very um, interesting question, and it has a nuance to it, because sometimes, and I mentioned this to you guys when we were discussing the program, I like to meet the other side and the other lawyer in a meeting, but sometimes I just try to make up a reason for a meeting to see who's driving the train. Is it the client or is it the lawyer and so on? When I do that meeting, this is the Neil that they meet. And, you know, they walk away thinking, by and large, that he's not such a horrible guy and he's going to be nice and he's going to be dealt with. And a lot of the lawyers that they hire for the other side will say that as well. But there are other times when I don't want anyone to hear the sound of my voice. And I mean that exactly specifically. I don't want to hear this. I don't want anybody to hear the sound of my voice. 
until they see me and hear me at the lectern. So I don't mm. introduce myself outside in the hallway or in the corridor. I don't say a word because I want them to be nervous about what they're going to get or what they're not going to get. Now, when you get to that lectern, sometimes you get more with sugar than you do with vinegar. So you have to know the audience. Sometimes the judge will let you be strident. Sometimes he or she won't. Sometimes your opposing counsel is not as experienced and will let you get away with more murder, if you you know, more things than other counsel will. All that's at play when you stand at that lecture. However, no matter what, when you are cross-examining somebody, they always say, you know, direct exam, cross-examination is about the examiner, right? We have the leading questions. We have to know what we want them to say. We have to get them to that point. Well, if you're catching someone in a lie, or you're catching someone in, you know, something that you want the judge to know is a very important fact, it, it, this isn't the time to be nice. It's a time to say, you mean when you said that the other day, you said it was three and now it's five? It, what happened between yesterday and today that, you know, three more things appear? You know, in other words, you just got to just jam the person up because you want them to sit in that box feeling uncomfortable. You want them to know that you know the truth. You also, you also... People, you know, are interesting. I remember one time uh, way back when you, we can never can find out what's in the safe deposit box, right? You get the card that when you went in, but you don't know what they took when they went in. And I remember saying to somebody, I had a piece of paper in my hand. I said, well, when you went in on October 23rd, you took $5,975.22. Just made up the number. And the person was looking at me and I was looking at them. They didn't know what I knew. They didn't know what I had. And they said, no, that's not right. It was $5,400, okay, and just whatever the number was. And they admitted something they had no basis to admit, no reason to admit, because they didn't know what I had. I got that person off center, and I got a result that I didn't necessarily expect, but I was glad I got it. So the courtroom is, no, I don't want to be vulgar, but it, you have to mind, you have to play with, you have to mind play around with a person's mind in cross-examination when you're in court. I mentioned to you guys before, this in the era where Zoom didn't exist, when you stand at the lectern, sometimes the, the person in the box will be looking toward their lawyer, not for the answers, they we don't do that, but for moral support or whatever. So I will generally move to another place in the courtroom, away from the lectern, to make that person have to look at me, even though they don't want to look at me. Sometimes they don't want to look at my face, you know, they want to see it, and I make them move, right? And if they don't look at me, I'll say, uh, uh, Ms. Youngman, I'm over here. Uh, look over here, please. Okay, so, you know, I mean, we, we I learned this from uh, Steve Kolodny. Um, when somebody goes wide and you say motion to strike, um, he, he would always say, and I use this all the time, uh, Mr. Memo, uh, would you answer, would it be okay if you just answered my question they asked next time? You know, make like, and, and I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, screw that mother. But, you know, I want you to get rattled. I want you to get you know, sort of worked up. So courtroom strategy is, uh, is a whole other thing. There are books written about cross-examination. There's, you know, things that you can really develop in terms of skill set that way. But it, that also comes through trial and error. So uh, that's sort of the best I could give you on that. When you're approaching a case, do you have a general preference for settlement first or do you are you okay with litigating any case of course so you know most most of us in this field know that in order to get a decent settlement your adversary has to know that you're ready willing and able to go to trial you know it trials trials are so interesting to me i, I don't everybody has maybe a different view but they're stressful because of the preparation the work that takes to do them and as i mentioned before you're working seven days a week when you're doing a trial but to me they're very zen-like because you get the opportunity to focus on one client, mm -hmm. one case, whereas in the office, it's, you know, calls, 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 people, 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 50 cases in a day, whatever you have to do. It's much, much more frenetic in many ways. And I have a very zen-like experience in doing these trials. So while I like trials, obviously, um, settlement is 90% of the time settlement occurs. And there's very good reason for it. When you're dealing with trials, you don't have any guarantee of the outcome. I don't care how good you are. And I say to people all the time, if any lawyer tells you they're going to guarantee your result, go away, hurry and hurry away, because that can't happen. 
So if I, they'll say, well, what's my, what are my odds? 99 to one. And I said, let's say it's 99 to one. Well, when we walk out of the courtroom, what if it's the 1%? And you say, well, you told me it's 99 to one. Okay. So you can't have any guaranteed result that you can with the settlement. You also could be um, creative. Back in the day, I represented Kurt Cobain and um, that was a, it was a dependency case. And when they wanted to move uh, to Seattle, we had to go through all sorts of creative machinations to allow them to get to Seattle with the DCFS here and there. Um, but because we were able to settle it, we were able to use some very creative solutions that couldn't have happened in a court. And obviously, I mean, that had a tragic result for him, but for the case, um, you have a lot more uh, flexibility, as we all know, when you're settling a case than the confines of what a judge can do in trial. But yeah, I mean, so the answer to your question is, yeah, I'd like to settle a case if we can, and the clients are happy with the settlement or reasonably happy, but you have to be prepared to, you know, walk into the courtroom and do battle if you have to. All right. I have one more case management question before we transition over to the legal topic in our last few minutes. How do you set expectations with clients, especially as we know, since family law has, there's a lot of discretion and it's very difficult to predict, you know, what the outcome is going to be in a lot of scenarios. It's a great question. How do you with difficult clients? So even a non-difficult client will ask you, you know, the same question, but yeah. Uh, it's it goes along the lines of what I said before. Um, you know, you there's no predictability when you're in court, so you have to tell a client uh, the truth, and you have to tell a client that there can be no guaranteed result. Um, that's easy to say, and those are just you know kind of precatory words. But then, in a particular case, um, my view is you start 50/50 when you walk into a courtroom. The judge can do A or do B. It's binary decision. But the facts of a particular case and each different case will tip that scale. So I could say to somebody, you know, I think you have a good chance of prevailing on its community property versus separate property or it's Van Camp or Pereira, whatever you want to say. But we are always truthful with our clients, as I'm sure all of us in this practice are, to tell them that we can't give them a guarantee, nor can we give them odds. And we could just say we're going to do our best on this issue. Now, that's why. You know, a lot of times judges, certainly more so now than ever before, want to see a side by side, your position, theirs, because quantitatively, it may not pay to take the risk in going to court. You may be able to bridge the gap when you see the side by side and both sides don't want to take the gamble. So, you know, we try to look at it qualitatively on the one side, can't guarantee it, and quantitatively to see what we're actually arguing about when, you know, paper, when the paper, you know, meets the opposite side, when we do the side by side, and maybe that can bridge the gap. But the, the, the ultimate answer is you can't ever, ever, ever deceive your client or to, you know, get sell them a bill of goods because that never, never works. They're going to come after you and say, well, you told me X, Y, and Z. And so what do I need that for? I tell every client who walks in here, you have to leave here thinking you were handled fairly legally, professionally. And financially, if you leave, you're thinking we ripped you off financially or we screwed around with you professionally. You're not going to say nice things about the firm. And why did I take you as a client? In that case, you're my every client who leaves here is my advertising. So, you know, if I go to billboard on Sunset Boulevard, that's different, but I can't. So each client has to leave relatively happy if, if the process is going to work. One of the things that you told us that we didn't get to, we talked about fees and how you Always, if there's ever an issue with fees, you always just adjust in the client's favor, yeah. um, right? Yeah. But let's talk about marriage and Knox because that's a new case uh, came down recently addressing need-based interim fee orders. So let's go, Professor Hirsch, for the few minutes we have left. I, hopefully, everybody read the case or, or knows the case, but. What do you think the importance of the case is really and how it's going to change those orders going forward? So first, just by way of background, in this case, it's 83 Calif 5th, 15. Um, and I'm just reading, so forgive me, I'm looking down. The trial court uh, kept continuing the wife's RFO for temporary fees, ultimately continuing to the date of trial, which precluded her from, uh, from representation during, uh, during trial. As a result, during trial, she failed to get a deed admitted into evidence. 
and that deed would have allowed her to prevail, potentially prevail, on her argument that the husband had transmuted uh, his premarital residence to community property. The Court of Appeals recognized that had she had a lawyer or had the court explained to her how the deed could be admitted into evidence, she would have had a reasonable probability of prevailing in getting the deed admitted and thus have a high probability of prevailing on her position on the transmutation issue. The failure to comply, and excuse me, the failure to promptly rule on her RFO for fees therefore prejudiced her. Uh, the court went on to say that even if the RFO had been denied, she could have filed a new one curing the defects in the original one, which uh, and made a new fee request prior to trial. And therefore, as a result of this failure on the lower court's part, the entire judgment was reversed, permitting her to file updated papers, even though four years have passed since the filing of her RFO. Now, what? why did I bring this up? First, because it's a current case. And secondly, uh, it, it seems a little incongruous because most of us don't have opponents who are in pro per. Um, I brought it up for two reasons. One, to show us all that the rarefied world we live in is not the world that everybody else lives in and that we have to be very cognizant and respectful of other people's you know, legal positions. Every time we go to court and you see an improper, we're very, oh God, you know, another improper, it's gonna take forever. But again, as I said earlier in this talk, those people have the same legal issues that you know, fancy people have with rich lawyers um, and expensive lawyers, and they need to be afforded the same dignity and respect that all of us want for ourselves and our clients. Um, how, do that, how does that relate to us? Well, obviously, sometimes, you know, RFOs for fees get continued or they get denied. You know, you can't, you can't let a stub toe stop you from going forward with what you need to get accomplished. This lady should have obviously pressed her issue further, but of course, she didn't know to do that. And it's a little unfortunate in my mind that nobody in the courtroom would have you know, taking her outside in the corridor and giving her a hint what to do to give her a bit of help, or she didn't reach out to some of the groups that you guys are dealing with, Buhai, Love and Quinn, you know, that we all support to give her help because obviously this lady desperately needed it. But not only do we want to have respect for these impropers and have a little more patience for them when we're sitting in the courtroom waiting for our turn, but I think we also want to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, if at first you don't succeed, keep trying and make sure that you get you know, your matter heard and adjudicated, because in this lady's case, it made the difference between winning and losing. And as the Court of Appeals said, she likely would have won and won substantially. There was a, there was a house we were talking about, and uh, she lost very badly. Anyway, so I thought it would be of interest to, uh, to the group. Do you think that this case will have an impact on the way that, uh, you know, our, our courts award fees or consider fees? Uh, need-based fee requests early in family law matters? I don't think, I mean, I, it's too early for me to tell, but I don't think the judges in our cases are going to give much, you know, do much differently in my mind. I do think, and I don't know who this judge was, I'm not going to say, even if I did, I wouldn't say, and I, I'm, I don't remember what county this was in, actually. I think it's a different jurisdiction, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it was a different, but, you know, here in LA County, I know, I believe, at least I hope that's right, that our judges would have sent this lady down to the resource center to be able to get some guidance on what to do. And it's unfortunate that they didn't do that there. I'm not castigating that person, that man or woman judge who was dealing with the case, but I, I'm just saying it shouldn't happen here. Um, so I think a judge here would have been more circumspect and giving her some direction to help her. Okay, uh, I would ask you another question, but we're down to our last 60 seconds. So. <laughs> Uh, everyone will have to uh, study the case a little bit more on their own. Um, we generally um, wrap up with a couple of uh, recurring final questions. Um, so for you, what, what would you like your legacy to be in the family law community yeah. or more broadly? You know what? Uh, yeah, decent lawyer, decent person, tried his best. You know, it's stuff like, I think, truly like we would all want for ourselves. You know, they doing to others is, you know, you want others to join to you. It's that, I mean, it's, we're all in this, we all are on the walk the same earth and same planet. We should be good and kind to each other and do our best at our job. That's it. All right. That's, uh, that, I don't know what more we could ask for you to say on that. One. <laughs> 
Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're all looking forward to uh, seeing you receive the Legends Award later this <laughs> month. Um, I know I'll be there. Um, but that's it for today. We're out of time. Uh, everyone's still listening. Please mark your calendars and join us for our next episodes uh, at 12.30 p.m. We have Melanie Mandels on November 2nd and Judge Susan Lopez-Giss on December 7th. And we'll be announcing the next slate soon. Thank you to Genna, Kathleen, and Belinda at the bar, the Family Law Executive Committee, which is now led by Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens, and of course, our section sponsors. Thank you very much. All right. Bye now.